All right, y'all turn to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to continue talking about sanctification today. And in all reality, we could just talk about this subject every week, no matter where we're at in the Bible. It's, it's, just, it's a grand part of the gospel, and in all reality, it's the outcome of the gospel. Now, before we get started, let's open with a word of prayer, but I want to remind y'all of a few things. I heard from Wayne, and Wayne's back home. He didn't feel up to making it today, but he went through surgery fine and everything, so he's back home and uh, said he'll see us this week. So I thank the Lord for that. Um, y'all remember Al in y'all's prayers. He's getting started on his, uh, his uh, dialysis at home, and it's kind of hard when you get going on. So y'all remember Al. And um, also, y'all remember George Robbins. I talked to his friend of mine. Y'all met him at the conference. He's a friend of mine from South Georgia, though. And I talked to him yesterday, and he's got Lyme disease. He had uh, gotten bit by a tick, or two ticks, actually, out just doing, you know, he's moved to, like, uh, off a farm. And uh, anyway, long story short, he got bit by a tick. He's got Lyme disease. So I, I think that can be uh, pretty, pretty hard. So y'all remember George in your prayers? Y'all remember Lee Waltman and remember Tim Stone Cipher. Both of them go to... Uh, have a prison ministry and they need your prayers so i forget to remind y'all about them y'all remember them and also want to thank gary and deborah they finished the tabernacle notes i got an email this morning they sent them all so um, i'll get them all saved and anybody that wants them they'll be all together and i really appreciate them doing that I, how they can even seem to understand what i wrote and all but they've got it on there so to be something y'all can use and anybody watching it wants them you let me know and i send them and i sure appreciate them doing that all right let's start with a word of prayer our Father and our God, we thank you for the privilege of coming together today to worship you and to praise your name. We pray that your Son, Jesus Christ, be lifted up in everything that we say and do today. Father, we pray that you draw us into a closer, uh, more intimate relationship with you and reveal your love to us, that the entire process of sanctification may be founded upon you and your attributes. Lord, let us be built up in Christ for his benefit and for his glory for all eternity. In Christ's name we ask these things. Amen. Alright, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 2. But what we're going to do is, we've talked about sanctification, in other words, the purpose is what I called the first class. And remember what the purpose of sanctification is. We talked about that we need to think about not what we've been saved from, but what we've been saved for. Sure, we've been saved from the penalty of our sins, and our sins have been paid, and we're saved from hell. But so many people tend to focus on nothing but that, and then what happens? They never realize they've been saved for something. Um, so we need to you know, keep our eye on that. Last time we talked about the difference between sin and sins, and what's being addressed in sanctification. And before we go any further, let's make sure we clear this up. Sanctification is not getting you past your sins. Sanctification is not getting you through or beyond whatever you consider to be your worst sin. You know, we all got certain sins that just grip us. And, but it's not that. Sanctification is our relationship to God. The sin is secondary. In other words, as your relationship to God grows, what happens to your desire to serve Him? It grows. So then what happens to the other stuff? It falls away. Okay? Now, let me read you the definition of sanctification. Webster's 1828 has uh, two of them. Number one, the act of making holy. And holy does not mean without sin. It means set apart. Okay, The act of making holy. In an evangelical sense, the act of God's grace. Now, you know, people that want to fight and argue and they'll run to the Webster's. If you just let Webster say what it says, he understood what it was about. He said it's an act of God's grace by which the affections of men are purified or alienated from sin and the world and exalted to a supreme love of God. In other words, the love of God replaces the love of self and the love of the world. And that's really what our problem is. God created man and gave him all things richly to enjoy, didn't he? But what was man created for? To serve, God. To serve and praise and worship God. Enjoy God forever. But what happened in the fall? The things that he gave man took up position in man's mind, didn't they? See, God was supposed to be foremost in man's mind. The tabernacle is a picture of him dwelling in the Holy of Holies. It's God dwelling in that place within us where we focus on and want to know and worship God. And those things that he gave Adam were secondary for his just daily use, you know, the things he needed, right? But what happened when he fell? The things of the world became the things that man worships, aren't they? And so sanctification literally is taking the person out of the world and then beginning the process of getting the world out of the person. 
Okay. So he says, verse number two, the act of consecrating or setting apart for a sacred purpose. Now I want y'all to notice in those two definitions you've got one is an act of just setting something apart. The other one is a process. And sanctification is both of them. There is sanctification that is an act that happens and it takes place like that. Then there's one that's an ongoing process. Now, let's start by going to uh, Genesis chapter 2. When we read our scriptures, we're going to have to determine when sanctification comes up, is this talking about the one-time event or is this talking about the process? Now, how do we determine which one's being used? From the context, how it's used, okay? For instance, the very first time it comes up will give us a whole lot of information about sanctification. Genesis 2, verse 3. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Then the very first thing that's ever sanctified in the scriptures is a day, isn't it? Now, did the day choose God? No. Did God choose the day because of some special inherent quality? That the day? No. What made this day special? God chose it. Was it special before God chose it? What do you think about me and you? You know, I mean, look, folks, this is what we need to know about sanctification right here. Did God first choose the day and then declare something about the day and the day begin to take on special prominence, didn't it? Well, what are we told about our salvation? Same thing, folks. It's amazing what we want to fight and argue about. And I know of no subject today that will get people riled up, save people, like election. They'll really get riled up about this. Has anyone ever had this thought run across your mind? Well, you know, Saturday, the Sabbath day, that's just not fair to Tuesday. Has anyone ever thought that? You don't think that, do you? How, what about, did God create clean and unclean animals? Mm -hmm. Did God pick the clean animals because of their lifestyle or something that He saw in them? Or did God create them that way? Has anyone ever thought, that's not fair to the pig? You don't think that, do you? Has anyone ever thought, you know, God chose Israel. That's not fair to the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites. Have you ever thought that? You had not thought that, have you? But when man enters in, what do we say? That ain't fair. Now why? Because we're men. If me and you were a day of the week, we'd be pointing at the Sabbath day. But we're men, and what do we think? We think the world revolves around us, don't we? Mm -hmm. Who do we think is the highest form of creature in the universe? Mm -hmm. We're told all the time we are, aren't we? Mm -hmm. We ain't even close. Folks, y'all know they've proved that a dolphin has just about as much brain power as a man. Mm -hmm. But who has man elevated? Himself. Man. He worships man. Now, the reason we want to talk about this day of sanctification to start with is... God picked the day, and God, for His own purpose, set that day apart from the other days, and from that point forward, that day became special, and what was that day's purpose? To be used to glorify God. What do y'all think the church is? It's the same thing, but people really get mad about this and say, that's not fair. Okay, you're right. Fair. Here's fair. Who in here has committed a sin? Okay, fair is we all go to hell and stay there for eternity. There's fair. You want fairness? We want the grace of God, don't we? So the first time something's sanctified, it's the Sabbath day. It's set apart from the other days for the Lord's use. So then, is it just people that are sanctified? No, here's a day. Go over to Exodus chapter 13. By the way, is that an ongoing process or is that something God did? He did it, and it's ongoing, isn't it? So in other words, in that sanctification is a picture of sanctification. How does the process of sanctification begin? With the act of sanctification. Before that day ever took on any meaning, what had happened to it first? It was sanctified or set apart in order that it could be used by God. And it's the same thing with believers. Now in Exodus 13, Verse 1 says, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast, it is mine. So what do we learn there? 
Whatever sanctified, what is it? It belongs to God. Now, who belongs to God in this world today? The church, the body of Christ. Now, He's the creator of everything. Cattle on a thousand hill. But in a sanctified position, who fills that position? The body of Christ. Okay, so we belong to the Lord. Go over to Exodus 40. Now, there we've got men sanctified, the firstborn. And by the way, animals too, all the firstborn. Exodus 40, verse 9. Alright, it says in Exodus 40, verse 9, Thou shalt take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle. By the way, the anointing oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. Nobody argues that across the board. People can see that in Scripture. Please notice what comes first in this process. The oil. What does that tell us? What comes first in the process? Oh, just the Holy Spirit of God acting. What's the very first thing that God did way back in the beginning? The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Okay? So it says, Thou shalt take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is therein and shalt hallow it. And all the vessels thereof it shall be holy. What does hallow mean? Sanctified. It's sanctified. It's set apart. It's holy. Like we're, we're uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Right? So he says, verse 10, Thou shalt anoint the altar of the burnt offering, all his vessels, and sanctify the altar, and it shall be an altar most holy. Then when something is sanctified, it is most holy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Does that mean the altar had no sin? No. Were they to use the altar for their uh, barbecue on the weekend? Mm -hmm. What was the altar for? Sure. For set apart for God's service. Well, if you're saved, guess what? You don't belong to yourselves. Are you saved to go do what you want to do every day of the week? Mm -hmm. But we've got the ability to do that, don't we? But what were we saved for? For God. God's purpose, to it's glorify it's, the Lord. It's easy for me to think that He set the church apart for us. Yeah, that's how we tend to yeah. think, isn't it? That's right. See, y'all remember all our wrong thinking. Hey, I, I heard a man say this, and it really is as good as anything I've ever heard. All our wrong thinking about God starts off being wrong because we start with us, don't we? Mm -hmm. We think about us and we work up to God. But how does everything in the Bible start? It starts, it starts with God working down. But we think we're the center of the universe, don't mm -hmm. we? But we're not. Now he says, verse 11, Thou shalt anoint the laborer and his foot and sanctify it. Thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and wash them with water and shall put upon Aaron the holy garments. By the way, what's that a type of when he puts the holy garments on Aaron? Righteousness. Has the Spirit already anointed him? Now see the order? It says, and anoint him and sanctify him that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Now, y'all notice the order there. First, he was anointed, then clothed and sanctified. Does anybody have a problem with how that took place? Hey, that's how it happens, right? Do you think it happens different with me and you? No, it's the same with us, okay? Uh, let's see. I want to show y'all a verse real quick. Y'all go to Psalm 65. While we're covering this, I just want to read this one. Psalm 65, 3. <coughs> he says, Iniquities prevail against me. <coughs> Who are all sins committed against? God. But until you're saved, you, you just think of sins against you or your sins against other people, don't you? But once we get saved, what do our sins become? They take on a new meaning every day, a little different, a little more every day, don't they? When you sin, who is the first person you think about? It's God that we've sinned against. Y'all remember when David cheated with Uriah's wife? Now I'd say he sinned against me if I was Uriah, wouldn't you? Then he, he look, he cheated against his, his wife, he cheated against him, and then he murdered him, didn't he? And what did David pray? Against thee and thee only, Lord, have I sinned. 
That doesn't mean I didn't commit any sin against them. He meant the only thing that was in the front of his mind is he had done something horrible in the name of God. Was he God's anointed man? Yes. Every time me and you sin, what do we do? We do the same thing. Now he says here in uh, verse 4, <clears throat> Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto me that he may dwell in thy courts, we shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. Does everybody see the order in that verse? Look at it again. Blessed is the man, now we're talking about purging away iniquities, aren't we? Blessed is the man whom thou choosest. How does the whole thing start? With God's choice. And causest to approach unto thee. What verse does that remind you all of? No man comes unto me unless the Father draw him, right? Mm -hmm. That, in order that he may dwell in thy courts. I could say he could be baptized into the body of Christ, couldn't I? Enter into the house of God. How did the whole process start? God's yeah, choice, isn't it? Now, why do people hate this doctrine so bad? Because they want to do it on themselves. They're not in control. Yeah, you're not in control. Man think wants to be about him, doesn't he? We want to think that it's we're we're doing things and we're choosing things. Can y'all imagine? Uh, I mean, look, there's only two ways we can look at this. It's it's God come down to two choices. Either I chose God or He chose me. Now that's the only two choices. There is no in between. And the people that say, yeah, but it's your faith that God rewarded, okay? So you're saying, I chose God, and then God rewarded me with salvation. But what does the Bible say? <clears throat> no. And man hates this. Y'all know they'll call you every name under the sun. Quit worrying about the man in the middle of Australia in 1580. Quit worrying about all of that and just talk about yourself. What about you? Are you going to tell me that you went seeking God and then God rewarded you with salvation? Huh. Folks, I did everything just the opposite. I run from God in the other direction as far as I could. And when I stopped, He was still there. I turned around and went the other way as far as I could. And when I stopped, He was there too. Remember what David said? No matter where he went, where, he said he could go to the deepest hell and God's there, wasn't he? See, it's God's choice. Now, y'all think how this ought to make us feel. Rather than start to try and claim some unholiness or unfairness in God, what ought we really be thinking? How unholy we are. Man, thank God He did this. Praise God. I have no... Look, this is grace, isn't it? Now, what does grace mean? Unmerited favor. If you had any any merit, would it be grace or would it detract from grace? Detract. Then how could it be any other way? Yeah. It can't. I mean, this is so clear in the Scriptures, but look, I'll get emails, people will be mad every time this subject comes up. Take it up in the Bible. Don't send me so-and-so's quote or this quote. No, look, just read the Scripture and see what mm -hmm. they say. You check it out and ask the Lord to show you. Now, let's go look at uh, how we can determine whether sanctification is a one-time act or if it's talking about the process. Now, go to 1 Corinthians to start. Hey, I'm sorry, y'all. Go to John 10. That's better. John 10. <clears throat> Look, I'm certain that this bar stool is going to collapse at any minute. Every <laughs> week. You hear it? All right, John 10, verse 36. Um, it says, Say ye of him, this is Christ speaking now, whom the Father hath sanctified, he's talking about himself, and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I'm the Son of God. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. Did he just say that the Father hath sanctified him? Mm -hmm. So was Christ sanctified? Was this something that had already happened? Is this a process or is this an event? It's an event. This one is. Now, what verse does that make you think of when you think of Jesus Christ being set aside? Anybody got a verse that comes to mind? How about Revelation 13, 8? He was set aside to be a Lamb of God before the foundation of the world. Did God choose His Son to perform this task? 
did Jesus Christ get picked because of something that God saw in him that other people didn't have? Folks, there were no other people. He's the Son of God and this was the plan. He was set aside to do this. Therefore, what happened? He did it. Was there any chance he was not going to do it? Is God's will going to be going to be you know tripped up and no, it ain't going to happen. All right, so there's where uh, an instance where it's a one-time thing. Go to First Corinthians one. All right, First Corinthians one. And remember, you just when you see the word, you want to determine from the context what it's talking about. Now we just saw some where it's just an act in the Old Testament. In other words, they set aside the, the vessel. They set aside the priest. Okay? In 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now, this sanctification that's in this verse, is it referring to an ongoing process or something that's already happened? Okay. It's already happened, hasn't it? Right? Look at the order. To them that are sanctified, then what comes next? Called. Called. You know what people, a lot of people are believed today? And I don't mean they're lost, folks. I don't mean that at all. I just mean this is most people's opinion. God called and I answered, so God sanctified me. But is that what it says here? No. Did God call the seven days and say, which one of y'all would like to come forth and be a special day? No. God said this day, didn't he? Mm -hmm. So it says, sanctified, then called. Look at next. With all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, you know what a man calling upon the name of the Lord really is? It's answering the call of God. Mm -hmm. Now, who made the first move in this verse? God. God made it, okay? So then there's an example where it's already happened. Go to chapter 6. Alright, chapter 6, uh, verse, we'll read from verse 9. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor feminine, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Was there anything in that list that hit home with you? If you say no, I'm going to add lying to that list because you just lied, didn't you? Right? Well, notice how it starts. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What does the Bible say about us by natural birth? Right. There's none righteous. What did Paul say about flesh and blood? It cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Is your old man going into God's kingdom? But what is your new man? Righteous. Folks, it's his right. Your new man, God sees just as righteous as Christ himself. And the process of sanctification is slowly getting me and you to think that way. Are you becoming more righteous in God's eyes as you're sanctified? No. You are as righteous as you'll ever be. There is no degrees of righteousness. You're as righteous as you'll ever be the moment God makes you righteous, aren't you? Then where does the change take place over time? In our mind. We, he brings us to see something, doesn't he? Now, after all that list of things, watch what he says in verse 11. And such were some of you, were, past tense, but ye are washed. What tense is washed? Past. 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 Y'all going to find that sanctification is closely tied to washing or cleansing. Okay? Ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Are those things all something that's already taking place? Is justification a long, slow process or is it a one-time event? It's a one-time event. It's the beginning and yet what came before your justification? Your sanctification. Right? It's kind of like talking about a kid. All right? A baby is born. He has a birth date, a time of birth, right? Eventually he'll have a time of death. What lies between his time of birth and his time of death? 
Life. Right? Life. But how did his life start? Birth. Birth. But did it really? No. It started with conception, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Did he ask to be conceived? Mm -hmm. Was his parents already at work before he ever came into the world? Mm -hmm. See, his birth was the realization of something taking place. And in all reality, he or she didn't come aware of it for a couple of years later, did they? A new baby doesn't realize, hey, I've got life here. All they know is what happened. I'm not comfortable. Where'd the dark go and all that? So then what does that child's process of life begin to be? Growing up or maturing. What is sanctification? Maturing. It's growing up in the Lord. All right, so there's another example of past tense. Y'all go and do two more. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, uh, verse 9. It says, Then said he, this is Christ, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will, what will, I come to do thy will. Did God come to do God's will? God the Son came to do the Father's will, didn't He? Mm -hmm. by, which, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now what kind of sanctification is that? Perfect. It's perfect, folks. It happened. It's perfect. Alright? I'm going to put it up here like this. And we are always got an example we can go back to. Did there come a day... Look, if you come back here, God makes Adam. And all mankind comes out of Adam, doesn't he? In Genesis chapter 10, you've got what people call the table of nations. If you count them, there's 70 of them in there. The implication is that God uh, sees the earth divided into 70 nations. And that keeps popping up in the scripture. Remember when Moses got there, there were 12 wells and 70 palm trees. When they picked the elders to represent the tribes, there were the 12 main and then the 70. How about when Jesus sent the 12 out to preach and then he sent out 70? It's a picture of this. But those 70 nations here, does, does there come a point when God reaches down and picks one man out of those 70 nations? Who? Abraham. And from that one man, I'm just going to draw it blue here. All of a sudden, that one man is picked. Have y'all ever heard anybody say that's not fair to Nahor? That's not fair to Nimrod or to Terror. You've never heard anyone say that, have you? You know why? Because it don't involve you. That's why. It don't involve us. When something personally involves us, then guess what? We're going to start getting worried about it, won't we? So now, he calls out this one man, Abraham. And what does he do through Abraham? Oops, he calls out a group of people, a nation, doesn't he? Does he take Abraham and put him into the position of the sanctified one? Yeah. Yeah. Was he set apart? Yeah. Absolutely. What about the nation Israel? Are they set apart? Mm -hmm. Does your heart bleed for the Amorites? Mm -hmm. I know I keep saying this, but I want y'all to see that's foolish thinking. Quit thinking about what God didn't do and look at what God did. Does God do all things well? Yeah. Then why do we ever need to look at what He didn't do? Yeah. I mean, it's a waste of time, isn't it? Seriously, it is a waste of time. You know, we say all the time, well, it's spilt milk. Don't cry over spilt milk. Folks, if God desired to do a thing, God does it and He's got a reason for it, right? Okay, so then He takes this one nation out. And from this moment when God calls them, literally, He calls them out and they, they Abraham's <coughs> descendants go into slavery. And God pulls them out of slavery, and again, they're set in the position of the sanctified, aren't they? Right? Are they in that position? It's theirs. Mm -hmm. Was it by the will of God? Yeah. It happened one time, and they're His nation, aren't they? But what begins from that point? Daily process. Mm -hmm. I mean a daily process. Literally 1,500 years of it, isn't it? And during that 1,500 years of watching the sanctification of that nation, I learned something. Those that said, well, I don't understand, but it's God's will and God does all things well, they get something by faith, don't they? 
What about all those ones that murmur and say this ain't fair? Hmm. What happened to them? They never believed. You see how simple that is? So at the end of 1500 years, you've got the true division, don't you? Because when God sanctified Abraham, He never really sanctified that physical nation. He said all Israel is not Israel. It was those that believe. And this comes over to the cross and what happens? Gentiles are added, those that believe. Now watch what he says in the next one. This is very important. Go to Jude. If Carlton were here, he would ask me what chapter, wouldn't he? <laughs> Every time we go to one that's got one, he says, what chapter? You know, it's going to remind me, Paul said in Romans about who are, who are we to say how God trained. Yeah. Yep. Imagine a, a, the pot, the clay, saying, wait a minute now, I don't, I'm not going to be an ashtray. Yeah. You know, I want to be a, you know, a vessel in the queen's house. Is that how it works? Who decides what the clay becomes? God does. The potter. The potter. Yeah. What are we made of? Clay. Folks, we're clay. That's all we are. Look, the whole problem with mankind today is the elevated thinking about himself. I mean, seriously, isn't that our problem today? Yeah. Have y'all met anyone today that doesn't... I know I shouldn't say anyone. The majority of people that you talk to today, do they believe they've got some rights? Yeah, yeah they insist on their rights, don't they? You want to be in the forefront. Well, what do we have a right to if you're saved? Yeah. You, well, we got a right to death in, in the flesh, don't we? We don't want justice right now. We don't want justice. But if you're saved, what do you have a right to? Nothing. Jesus Christ. Right to you. You've got a right to Jesus Christ. There's what you got a right to. We're now, this, huh? Jude 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Y'all see the order there? Now what is that sanctification? That's one time act, isn't it? Past tense. Folks, that's the choice of God. That is the sanctification. Now look what he says again. Them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved. How in the world did we ever let anyone tell us that the people in this book did not have eternal security? Hmm. Preserved. Come on, does God know how to preserve a thing? Mm -hmm. Next it says, and called. Well, you know there's an old, what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Well, y'all look at that verse and you tell me what came first. The salvation or the plan of God? What came first, the action of the Spirit or the action of the man? The action of the Spirit. Y'all find me a verse in the Scripture where the saved man acts first. There ain't one. I challenge you. What did Adam do? What is man? You know, he got, me and Maurice was talking about this. He brought up something. It's an interesting point. God put man in the garden, didn't He? Now, did man have the capacity to act according to his own will? He did. But while his will was on God, he's in an innocent condition, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a verse that said that he had any single thought about eating from the tree of life? Mm -hmm. There ain't one. Mm -hmm. Did he ever once look into the tree of life? Mm -hmm. what, what did he look into? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see the point? Man don't go seeking life. What's the Bible say? There's none mm -hmm. that seeketh after God. No, not one. Then if God doesn't draw us, guess what? Mm -hmm. Ain't nobody coming. And folks, that's how it is in the Bible. So then these people, that's a one time sanctified. But what does that do? That puts them into the position of the sanctified, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Once the person's in the position of the sanctified, what begins then? The ongoing process of sanctification. I'm splitting them up right now just so we can understand the terms. But in all reality, this is not sanctified over here. This is man becoming aware of God's sanctification that took place back here. It's a moment when God says, start. Like the way, begin the plan. And what happens? Things begin to happen. Long before he ever chose Abraham, the events of Nimrod and the Tower of Babel were stacking up, weren't they? Look at Israel. When Israel was in Egypt, before they ever knew anything about God calling them, did God start turning the events in Egypt against them? Mm -hmm. Didn't he? When a baby's in its mother's womb, I've been told that all of a sudden that baby will just start turning. I don't know if this is true or not. Does he, any of y'all know about that? 
the baby starts turning to get itself out of the womb. Have y'all ever heard that? Mm -hmm. yeah, is that true, Chris? Yeah, it turns itself. That What's it getting ready for? Delivery. delivery. What was God doing with Egypt? Or Israel? Delivery. He getting them ready for delivery, wasn't he? Okay, so now, this is the process. But now let's go in the Old Testament and look at some times when it's not a one-time event. Go over to Exodus 19. Alright, Exodus 19. Now we're going to look at times when it's a process. I'll, I'll put this apart. We've got an act. And then we've got a process. And we're separating these for the purpose of study. Like, uh, like we separate birth from life. But you can't separate a baby's birth from its life, can you? We talk about it, but is it really separate? Mm -hmm. Birth is the beginning of life, isn't it? So this act is the beginning of this process. What's the end of it? Does there come a day when there's an end? When does it end? Death. Death. <clears throat> this is what caused the Apostle Paul over here to say, I pray your whole body, soul, and spirit be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when will your sanctification be complete? When you're with the Lord. Alright? Will it be completed while you're on this earth? Now we're going get to uh, get into this and talk about it because uh, some things happened with John Wesley and some, some thinking started that you reach a point where you're sanctified. You know, per perfect. You're without sin. Or uh, some people teach that it's an event and you seek it, you get it. And, are y'all familiar with like people talk about the second act of the Spirit? You mm -hmm. might know about that. It's where the holiness movement come from because they come out of, out of Methodist. That's where they come from. And what do the holiness say takes place? You're saved, but then there comes a day when something happens, doesn't it? And once that happens, what are you? You're, you're without sin. You're perfect, okay? Well, if that's the case, Paul didn't get the letter regarding that because 25 years after his salvation, what did he say? Sin dwelled in him, didn't he? Now, yeah, it's still dwelling, right? So um, the best case to prove that sanctification is not an event or an experience, but does it contain events and experiences? Yes. And they can be an aid to sanctification, but that's not sanctification. Sanctification is not something that's going to be completed in this lifetime. To prove it's not an event. Did we just read that the Corinthians are sanctified? You ever seen a more messed up church than the one at Corinth? You, I mean, see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So sanctified doesn't mean without sin. Doesn't mean perfect, does it? Okay, now let's go look at these. Alright, in uh, Exodus 19, 22. Here's where it's a process. And let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. So is that something that happens once or is that something that's ongoing? Do they play a part in it? Mm -hmm. Did the Lord just say, you priest, just look to me and I'm going to do it all? Did the Lord say, you head to the, to the tabernacle and on your way I'm going to knock you into the lava or the labor? No. Did they have a responsibility? Mm -hmm. So then God told them how to cleanse, but what did they have to do? do it. They had to do it. They had to be obedient, didn't they? Okay, now let's go look at another one. That's a process. The next one would be Exodus 31. Exodus 31, 12. Now, has God already called Israel at this point? This is, this is the tabernacle instruction. Has He already chosen them and called them out and delivered them from bondage? He has. So they're in the position of the sanctified nation, aren't they? But watch what he says in verse 12. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. What tense is doth sanctify? It's present tense, isn't it? But they've already been sanctified. Were they set apart? Was God performing a work in them? Then it's an ongoing thing. What about every saved person? It's the same thing. Folks, God chooses you, sets you apart, and begins a work in you. And what did the Apostle Paul say? 
he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What does that tell you? It ain't going to be completed in this life, is it? Now, there are people that say sanctification is just turning over to the Lord. But what does the verse before that verse say? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you. We're called to be obedient, aren't we? Y'all, you know there's a, a phrase that sprung up, a let go, let God. Y'all remember that one? I, I had a friend that used to say that all the time. Just let go and let God. In other words, they say all it comes down to is sin. Is you've just got to acknowledge that it's sin and turn it over to Christ and He'll take care of all of it. Now, if that's the case, we got 27, we'll take away four. We got about 20 books, epistles in the New Testament that about half of them are wasted ink, aren't they? Because what are they all telling us how to do? How to live in sanctification, aren't they? Well, you know, if it was a, an event that you aspired to, if it was a, an experience and you needed it one time, it would be preached in the epistles just like salvation. It would be preached like just again. Paul wouldn't say, let him that stole steal no more. He wouldn't say, mortify your members. He wouldn't say that. He would say, pray to God to attain unto this second grace. Okay, pray for this event. But he doesn't say that, does he? Okay, so this is, a, this is again, it's an ongoing thing here. Now let's go to the New Testament. 17, John 17, 17. You know, let's start with the verse 6. John 17, 6. Alright, this is the night before Jesus dies. What's his mind on the night before he dies? His apostles, folks. It's on his disciples. Do you see anything in here about Lord the pain? Lord numb this? Or Lord make it shorter? No. What's his mind on? His people. Come on, if you were about to die and leave this world. Okay? Hey Chris, if you knew right now when you was going to die today at 3 o'clock, what would you be worried about? Family. Dina, your daughter, right? You'd be worried about your wife and your children, wouldn't you? What would you be making plans for? Your, your wife and your children. So then what is Jesus Christ doing here? He's about to leave and he's, he's praying about his bride here. He says, I, verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Notice that. How did they become Christ? He gave it to them. Now, is this something where God looked out and saw everyone that had that special spark and God had to come up with a plan to reward them? That's not grace, folks. It's not grace at all. He says, Thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. So then have they been taken out of the world? Now, does that mean they've been taken off the earth? No. It means their citizenship has changed, hasn't it? The one moment before they were taken out of the world, were they citizens of the kingdom of this world? Mm -hmm. Who's the God of this world? Mm -hmm. Satan. So then what happened to them when they were taken out of the world? They were translated into a different kingdom, weren't they? Now he says, come down to verse uh, 14. He continues with the same thought. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because, now this is the strongest argument for election that you can find in me. Watch. The world have hated them because they are not of the world. You know what that means? The world hates them because their the world's not chosen, are they? I mean, who y'all know how it is. Have y'all ever watched, uh, I used to love to watch the Miss America and Miss USA and all. Number two, what the first runner up. They, they're standing there, both of them, aren't they? And they say, and the winner is, and it's me and Chris standing there, and the winner is Chris. And I, oh, great, and I hug him, and what am I really wanting to do? Yeah. I'm, I'm dying inside, right? I'm putting on a big false air. Y'all have seen them do it. Oh, you know, they do this and all that. But what is really going on there? They're hurting. Why are they hurting? Because they weren't chosen. 
folks, you know how you know what number one would do. How uh, how about Tanya Harding and Nancy Kerrigan? There's an example. Teammates, right? Oh boy, they're good teammates. How did Tanya feel about Nancy? She hated her, right? This is the process. Now he says, verse uh, fifteen. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. Then is it God's desire that you be removed from this present evil world physically? But there's people teaching you, you've got to get removed, don't you? He said, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Now why would Christ pray such a thing? Are we living in this present evil world? By God keeping us from the evil, what is that designed to do? It's sanctification, but what is it designed? He could just make it impossible for you to ever sin again, couldn't he? But that ain't what it says. It's setting you apart. But what's it teaching you? It opens to grow in the Lord. But what's it, what's it teaching us, though? It's faith that he can do it, isn't it? Can God keep us from the evil? Is that something you just all of a sudden one day learn and you've got it from that point forward? No, we've got to be shown constantly, don't we? He says, 16... They are not of the world. Then have these people already been sanctified? Yes. yes. As I am not of the world, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Then this sanctification, is Jesus praying for a one-time event to claim these as his own? Or is he praying for their daily sanctification? Daily, daily. Through the word. How did Paul say the same thing? Through the word, through the washing of the water of the word. In Paul's case, it's a comparison to a bride. It's a, in Ephesians 5, it's a wife and the husband, right? Husbands love your wives. And then it says he bought the church like a wife that he might wash her and cleanse her. All right, you ladies, if you had your wedding this afternoon, you reckon you're going to take a shower? I mean, anybody going to iron your dress? Or are you gonna, don't you want to be clean and presentable? Do you get yourself ready for that moment? Y'all see the picture? This is a cleansing. It's a sanctifying. Matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, what does it say about those saints over there that go to the wedding? They have made themselves ready. Now, do you have a responsibility in it? Yes. But who gives us the power? God. Who even creates the will in us? God. When God creates the will, what do we got to do? We got to be obedient to it. Does God give us the power? Mm -hmm. we got to exercise the power, don't we? Is this something you're going to just learn one day and that's it, you've got it? Mm -hmm. Folks, we're like little kids. I've told you all so many times about uh, when Sienna, y'all remember when Sienna was just little bitty and she'd come to class and she wasn't even standing yet. She took her first steps over here. She said her first words over here. She was trying to stand up and couldn't and was falling. And she was the cutest little thing. But she stood up one day and Lexi had her by her belt loop. And she stood up like that and she did that. And all of a sudden she looked so surprised and she looked up and she was standing. She didn't know Lexi had her belt loop. Lexi let go of her belt loop and what happened? She was she standing? Was that it from that moment forward? Was she standing on her own two feet? She's still falling, isn't she? What did she learn that day? It could be done, mm -hmm. couldn't it? Could it be done? Mm -hmm. Later she started walking, didn't she? Is it ever ending with us learning that with God, nothing is impossible? Hey, this is the process now. Um, let's see. So there's an ongoing sanctification. Go over to 1 Thessalonians 4. We'll get a practical, uh, practical explanation of it. Thessalonians 4.1 He says, Furthermore then we beseech you. Now what does it mean to beseech somebody? Beg. To plead with them. Then do they play a role in it? Yes. He said, Furthermore then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you. What does exhort mean? Here we go. Yeah, to encourage, isn't it? So is Paul telling them, beseeching them, begging them to do something and encouraging them that it can be done? Yeah. 
He said, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Well, there's the process, isn't it? What comes first? Doctrine, you've got to understand what you're supposed to do, don't you? But then what do you have to do? You do it. And you can't understand any of it unless God's already set you aside, can you? Now, imagine if this were all just a process whereby one day it happened, you got this second act of grace, and you were finished with it. Would verses like this be necessary? How did Paul say this process would go? It would abound more and more. Make sense? Verse 2. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. That you should abstain from fornication. Is that a responsibility? Yeah. Now literally, what is that talking about? What is fornication? Just well, it, it's... Yeah, I mean, look, we all know what it is physically. Yeah. Look, technically, adultery is a man sleeping with a married woman. Fornication is a man sleeping with an unmarried woman, technically, right? But is should we be doing either one of those? No. No, we got no business with either one of them doing. But... In the context, what is it that it, and I'm not saying it's not talking about that. Yes, physically, we're supposed to avoid that. But in the context, what brought Israel to her knees? Idolatry. Idolatry. What did she do? She, 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 she cheated on God. She mixed in with those people that worshipped other gods, didn't she? Did she keep herself in the sanctified position? Clean and holy. She became unclean. How? By walking the way the world walks. She put Israel mixed over with a group of people that said that's a good thing to sacrifice your babies. And so what did Israel do? They started sacrificing their babies. Me and you are living in a country where somebody say, you know, it won't hurt you to, uh, you don't have to study your Bible. I mean, that's old. That's ain't. You don't know all the stuff they tell us is okay. Is it okay? No. no, it's not okay. Now he says this is God's will. Now watch the reason. Verse 4. That, or in order that, Every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. So then is there a way in which we possess our vessel? In sanctification and honor. Now Paul said the same thing when he was writing to, the, uh, uh, to Timothy. He said that in the house of God there's all kind of vessels, aren't there? He said, but a man needs to purge himself and he'll be a vessel sanctified and fit for the master's use for me. What made Israel unfit for God to use back here at certain points? They, they got mixed in with the other people and got all unclean, didn't they? And it's not that those people made them unclean. It's the practices of the people. Can you and I get involved in things that make us unfit for God's use? Sure, we do it all the time. We can let our thinking get so out of whack that we become unfit for God's use. Well, what do you got to do? Clean yourself. Okay, go to 2 Corinthians 7. This is the best verse that I know of that speaks on the process of sanctification. He's just told these Corinthians that they need to come out from among people, this, this other group of folks. He said, the righteous have no business with the unrighteous. Now, y'all know how quickly people say today that this is talking about the religious system today. Did the religious system of today exist in Corinth 2,000 years ago? There was a religious system, but it wasn't the false churches of the day. It wasn't the, I shouldn't say false church. It wasn't the church of the day, was it? And you know, I know men that believe if you won't quit going to a church, you ain't saved. They use this for their context. Y'all heard that, haven't you? They won't come out from among them. Y'all know that. Who was he telling them to come out from among? First off, who's he talking to? The Corinthians. Who were the Corinthians among a bunch of idolatrous pagans. What were they doing in the context? They're still taking part in all that, eating their sacrifices. What Paul's telling them to do? He said, you've been set apart. Don't go keep going taking into that, right? So watch verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be you separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I'll be a father unto you. You shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises. What was the promise? Come out from among them. Clean yourself and you'll be a child of God. 
Doesn't mean you are not a child. It actually says sons and daughters. Doesn't mean you're not a born child of God. It means you're a son in a position of sonship and heir. Now watch what he says in, uh, in 7 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And y'all think of a better verse that describes sanctification? Perfecting holiness? Now, is this something that you can just do? Monks think so, don't they? Mon mon uh, monasteries, men recognized a long time ago the world was evil, and it is. So what did they decide? We'll separate from the world. We'll get on a mountaintop and we'll separate from the world and we'll have nothing to do with the world. Did that cure their uncleanness? No. Uh, Hindus wow. are a good example of that. Hindus, yeah. Look, we got a, a Buddhist temple right here in Bayou Battery. Y'all, everybody, I don't know how many y'all know about it. Lexi does. She's straight out the Bayou. <laughs> There's a Buddhist <laughs> temple down there, right? That, it, that Buddhist temple, those men have separated themselves from the world, haven't they? They go out in public. Oh, they go out in public? Okay. But but like you're talking, though, you, we can't do it. But what happened? You know what one of them did the other one about two years ago? Yep. Killed him with a, with a rolling pin oh in the kitchen. So when they separated, did they separate or did they bring the world with them? Probably the world. See, the world's not the problem, folks. The devil's not the problem. What's the problem? Yeah. We are. Sin is the problem. Mm -hmm. So then... Different societies believe you can separate and clean yourself up, can you? Some people say education's the answer. We wouldn't have all this if we would just educate. Well, we've got the most extensive education system that's ever existed in the world today, and are we doing better or worse? All right, some people say, no, you've got to crack down and we'll legislate. We'll, we'll have a police state. Does that work? There is no solution for sin except the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it's never going to be peace. There's never been peace since Cain killed Abel, has there? Mm -hmm. There'll never be peace until the Lord Jesus Christ establishes peace. Peace only exists on this earth in one place. It existed in Abel and it's existed in men all the way through. And where is that peace always abided at? In their conscience. Do you have that peace today? Mm -hmm. The only way you can have that peace is to know that you are not... Uh, responsible for cleansing the penalty for your sin because what? how much do you have to cleanse to get rid of it? All of it. Has anyone ever got that done? How in the world could you serve the Lord when you can't even begin to think about the Lord? You can't, can you? You know, I always use this example and if you, any of y'all are Seinfeld fans, do y'all remember the episode where Kramer just started working at the office of some place? Yeah. You remember that one? Yeah. He just started wearing a suit and going in, carrying a briefcase and working on a report. And he just started working there. Nobody hired him. He just started working there. He went into the office one day, sat down in front of the boss. He said, I'll tell you, this job's killing me. This, this grind and all. And the guy takes his report and he looks at it and he says, what is this? He says, I've been working on it. He looks at it and he said, this is, this is like you have no idea what you're doing. And he's like stunned, shocked, wasn't he? He said, who are you? And the guy said, well, he said, well, I'm Kramer, you know. He said, who hired you? And he's like, hired? Well, nobody hired me. He said, you don't belong here. Get out of here. Now, what did Jesus Christ say? The man would come to him and say what? Lord, Lord, I've done many wonderful things in your name. I did this religious thing and that religious thing. I quit drinking, smoking, gambling, chasing, well, all whatever it is. And what does the Lord say? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. If the Lord doesn't know you, no sanctification is going to take place. You can be the most moral character the world's ever seen. Hell's going to be packed full of moral characters. There probably has never been a more moral, peace-minded man than Gandhi. And what was Gandhi's last three words? Wrong, wrong, wrong. His false god. Gandhi said, I looked into Christianity. I don't see any value in this Jesus Christ. Mm. You'll see how sad that is? You can't sanctify yourself. You can't do anything about it. You've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And He does the work in you. He gives you the will and the power. And our part is to be faithful and obedient in it. Okay. Any questions about that? Mm. Alright, let's take a break.